have you guys heard about how figs are pollinated? I can tell you real yeah, quick about the wasp. The, yeah, so uh, basically there's two types of figs in the world. There's some that are self-fertile. Most of the ones you grow in your garden are self-fertile and they don't require a, a wasp pollinator at all. Okay. The vast majority of commercially grown figs do require a very specific uh, wasp to pollinate them. And that's a, actually, it's a very fascinating uh, process. Now, basically, there's thousands of types of figs and there are thousands of types of wasps that each specialize in a very specific type of fig. But basically, what a fig fruit is, is it's a flower with a lot of tiny little uh, flowerlets, much like a sunflower, but it's twisted in on itself. Mm -hmm. So that's what forms that fruit. And now there's a tiny little opening down on the bottom mm -hmm. that only lets in one type of insect, and it's these very specific wasps. The type of fig that they enter, again, has to do with the type of fig that it is. The figs that require wasp pollination have very short flowers. And so the wasps are able to lay eggs at the base of those flowers. And as the eggs hatch, they form two very different, physically different forms of the wasps. Now, male fig wasps are very different than the female. They don't have wings. They have very tiny eyes. They have very tiny antenna. Basically, they're blind, they can't really move, and they never leave the fig. Wow. Their one job is basically they burrow a little hole out of the fig, fertilize the female, and now then the females leave, and again, they search for another fig. Now, this is what's called a very closely symbiotic relationship. Some of the closely, most closely intertwined relationships in the whole animal kingdom. And now, so if, if a wasp enters the wrong type of fig, she dies and the fig is not pollinated. Wow. And if, a, if the wasp uh, is not in an area of a fig that needs pollination, their, their figs will never become pollinated. Because again, no other insect, it seems like, is able to actually get inside the fig and reproduce. Wow. And now you may be worried when you eat a fig, if when oh. you're crunching on the seeds, if you're eating a wasp as well. Yeah. But interestingly enough, uh, after the wasp die inside the fig, the fig itself secretes an enzyme and digests yeah, that wasp yeah. and reincorporates it back into the plant. Yeah. So technically, I guess you are eating the wasp, but in a different form. Right. But no, you don't have to worry about actually eating wasps when you're eating the figs. <laughs> you might get all kinds of protein from the wasp. Right. And uh, so this is a, obviously a plant feeding wasp. Mm. It is technically a parasitoid or a parasite on the fig itself, but it's a great example that in Hymenoptera, bees and wasps especially, yeah. There's really almost a limitless amount of variety in the types uh, of wasps and what they use as their prey and really their nest where they lay their young. And so figs are a great example of just one of the many thousands of incredibly intertwined relationships yeah. that these wasps do have with their environment. Um, there are also wasps that live in other hard seeds of plants like holly seeds and that kind of thing, even though holly seeds aren't a true seed. Uh, I guess it's more of a berry. Um, yeah. But uh, there are also seed feeding wasps where the wasp will inject a seed into the, or inject a, their own little uh, egg into the seed before it develops that super hard outer shell. And then they'll use that seed as a little nest, similar to how parasoid wasps use a hardened shell of an insect as their nest. Um, but again, just keep in mind, next time you're eating a fig, more than likely you owe that fig to a wasp. <laughs> Let's actually first go back to the butterfly house then. Cool. Then we'll go to the garden, you'll look at that main hotel you made. Mm -hmm. And then we'll look at the cup plant Perfect. as probably our last plant insect look. And then we're going to do a quick sprint to the various um, houses that you made, okay? Cool. And so real quick, these right here are two butterfly houses that we installed here. And now butterfly houses, um, really what they're engineered to do is give butterflies a place to spend the night. Uh, normally, a lot of butterflies will find maybe a hollow in a tree or a very sheltered spot to spend the night. This kind of recreates that kind of environment just to give them a place to live for the night. So this isn't engineered to give butterflies a place to lay their young or anything to that regard. But as an added benefit, it also gives shelter to a wide variety of other insects as well. Um, so wasps, uh, moths, ants, really any insect that's passing through the area if it's caught out in a storm or caught far from home, butterfly houses like this are a great way to kind of just give some extra shelter onto your property. If you're not able to have, uh, you know, grass tufts or trees with a hollow in it or anything like that. So this morning I noticed there were some wasps kind of 
warming up for the day. It looked like they were some solitary wasps, which again are very docile and they're a pleasure to watch. Um, but so if you do ever have something like this on your property, just be aware that there will be more taking up residence in these houses uh, than a butterfly. But also we've seen plenty of butterflies use them as well. So it's just something you know, cool to put on your property. It does look neat. Uh, that again, just provides a little bit extra habitat. And why they wouldn't be laying their eggs in there and raising them is because they lay their eggs on their food plants. Mm -hmm. And exactly. since you don't have any food plants in there, they're not going to be reproducing in there. Where can you find it's, plans to build them? Uh, online, you can find them very easily or just at the end of class, talk to me, I'll tell you exactly how to make it. Is that hollow completely inside? Exactly, hollow, hollow completely on the inside. And then the only specific thing is just you want to make these wide enough to let insects in, but, but it's kind of small enough to keep birds and other predators out. Uh, and then, just like Pat said, um, another important thing to keep in mind, especially if you're planting to attract butterflies, is you'll always want to have a plant that attracts the adult form, something that has easily accept accessible nectar sources for that adult to live on, and also larval host plants where they'll want to lay their eggs. Try to have both of those in and around your garden, you'll have a, a good supply of caterpillars and, uh, and butterflies as well. And another important point is to get that one moment we're looking at butterflies and moths as these gorgeous, you know, flights, flying insects through the air that are just flitting around and decorating our gardens. And the next moment we're looking at the white butterfly and thinking pest. And of course, once again, let go of that paradigm. Yeah. It's just basically herbivores and carnivores. And if you get balance, none of them are pests and they're all beneficial. They're all just hmm. part, part of the world, you know? It is a different paradigm. It's a paradigm that we don't like, you know? No. We want good <laughs> and bad, freak. you know? Earth and Earth. all the time. <laughs> and one of my favorite examples is thrips feed on spider mites. Thrips are a pest. Oh, wait a minute, but they feed on pests. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, you, you just don't really want to get into that paradigm because then you find yourself sometimes going over the top. And when I start talking about milkweed, I've got an example that I'll share with you of people just like losing track of the fact that it's about balance. It's about the world already works. We want to help to repair the damage we've done. And then it's not automatic. It doesn't need us. The world has done very well without us. In fact, the opposite is occurring. <laughs> okay, let's go look at the bee hotel. But basically, the vast majority of solitary bees here in the States live in the ground. About 70% make their burrows in the ground and so when you're looking around on your property and you see a hole in the ground with a pile of soil next to it there's actually a good chance that that's actually a solitary bee or wasp making their nest in the ground now the other 30 percent of solitary bees in the states make their nest in holes that have already been bored in dead dead trees mostly a dead standing tree that's been bored into by beetle larvae and other boring insects so these creatures don't make holes themselves but actually, because of that, it's very easy for you to supply them housing in the form of a man-made bee house. And so what this house, again, attempts to recreate is a dead standing tree in nature that's been bored into by beetle larvae. And what those native or those solitary bees do is they'll find a tunnel like this and they'll go down to the bottom. And they gather a ball of pollen about the size of a pencil eraser. They mix it with a little bit of nectar, but it's mostly pollen. And they put that down at the base of the tunnel. And then they lay an egg right on top of that and they seal off that little room, commonly called a cell. And they repeat that process until they fill their whole tunnel. Most lay about 12 eggs or so in a six inch, uh, a six inch deep hole like this one. And now what they close those entrances in differs uh, depending on species, excuse me. So now as we can see here, there's a lot of mud that's been used to close these holes. That was done by a mason bee. Now mason bees, just like a human mason, they use mud and maybe some small rocks to build pretty solid mud walls for their nests. Um, another very common solitary bee that nests in wood is a leaf cutter bee. And as you, if you couldn't tell by their name, they use pieces of chewed up uh, leaves to, uh, to close off their cells. And actually some species also use leaves as a type of wallpaper to coat the inside of the tunnels to kind of protect their young from fungal outbreaks and that kind of thing. I recommend after I talk real quick, come and just look at the, the entrances to these uh, nests that have been sealed. There's also a very uh, beneficial type of wasp called a humanid wasp or commonly a potter wasp. 
that also do take residence in these houses. Now they eat small caterpillars and they provision their cells with small caterpillars and other prey for their young rather than using pollen. I'm gonna jump in. There's lots of different solitary wasps that'll use them, including the mud dauber wasps and then the kind that gather grass. And so if you have lots of different sizes of holes, in the spring you'll have the, a lot of the mason bees that he's talking about and then you'll have leaf cutter bees and then right now you'll see lots of little tiny wasps and then as big the big ones that have big blue wings those are mud daubers and they're all solitary so if you had this right by your door it'd be perfectly safe to um, observe them because they don't have a colony that they're protecting they lay their eggs and then they never see their young hatch and eat the provisions that they brought for them and most of the potter wasps actually collect spiders. So, and they, they just paralyze them and stuff them in there. So if you ever open those up, you'll find out, usually they specialize in one species. Right, and like she just mentioned, uh, and we learned earlier, most of the adult versions of these species only live for several weeks. And so really the vast majority of their lives are spent locked away in these protective cells. Um, so it's important if you do have a house like this, try and just keep it in one spot. Don't try and move it around a lot, especially right after uh, their eggs hatch. They're very sensitive to vibration, so just leave these sitting. Um, but as you walk and look, an easy way to tell a potter wasp residence versus a mason bee residence is how smooth the mud is on the outside. Potter wasps are excellent at really smoothing out the mud, and so some of these you can tell are very smoothed out caps to the entrance. That's indicative of a potter wasp Again, in the humanid family, they're not all potter wasps. And again, the mud daubers generally don't nest in holes like this. They'll generally actually make their own nest out of mud. You've probably seen them. They hang uh, vertically, kind of up and down. And yes, they do usually specialize in spiders, but there's always an exception to that rule, especially in wasps. Oh, I always get potters in my, um, I put bamboo out. So they definitely use Right, them. yeah, that, I've yeah. never actually seen that. But yeah. um, so again, take a look. There's also some rough, some more rougher looking caps, and that's indicative of a mason bee. They just don't take quite as much time to smooth out that edge. So if you'd like, just take a quick look and see. Um, I don't really notice many leaf cutters taking up residence in this, but leaf cutters are more of a uh, late spring all the way to late summer bee. And so like Nancy was saying, these are really a true community of bees where there will always be something active depending on their life cycle. And maybe the, the leaf cutter bees in the area just aren't really active yet enough to really be provisioning these houses yet. And one of the other things we wanted to talk about while we're out here is farmscaping. And so a lot of the little bees that use cavities will use things like uh, elderberry or uh, raspberry stems. So you can often find little small carpenter bees in a raspberry or, or a blackberry or um, a black raspberry stem. And then anything that has a pithy stem, they can use that. And oftentimes if you have a um, wing stem, if you open those up in the middle of the um, winter, you'll find little grubs in there as well. So anything that has a firm stem over the winter that they can get into, they right. might So if in. possible, you know, before cutting everything down to the ground, leave everything, especially with the pithy stem, like Nancy said, standing for as long as possible, just to give bees a chance to actually use those as nesting material. And actually you'll surprise, they don't look as bad as you might think when you're cutting them down. Some sticks kind of look nice in the wintertime when they're kind of topped with a little bit of snow. And so I recommend, you know, leaving plants uh, as, as up and uh, kind of standing as possible. And you can even, uh, you know, if they're too unsightly, maybe cut down a bush only halfway or so to be more easily masked by other plants, but still give bees and other stem nesting insects a place to live. And this one's walnut, but sumac is another um, good one. But uh, walnuts actually do have pithy stems. So my boss, um, Mace Vaughn, he, he, when he's around a elderberry, he's always like breaking off the tips to make a space for bees to come nest in. So, so we, we want to um, just talk a minute about farmscaping. So we'll come down with um, Pat over here. Great. So um, Pat caught um, a little, what we call a sweat bee. And this is one that you can actually you can get to just sort of recognize it's the one it's called Halictus legatus and it's one of the most common bees we have so um yeah let's go look at the bee houses and then let's go inside because we have a lot of territory to we'll just go ahead on they said it's too wet well, okay. and they have, we have a cabin inside as well that we brought so everyone okay. can